Akira. He's got clout. Hello, everyone. Apologies for the delay. I hope this is all working. Hopefully, I'm up to this. I'm learning how to manage this, I think. I'm not really interested, I suppose, in slowing down, although it has been a bit much in the last year and a half. I do better in some ways when I'm working flat out. So, yeah, I've thought about slowing but I've decided against it. There are times in your life where it's not time to slow down. It's time to become more efficient. That's the thing. You can become so efficient. You end up doing things in five minutes that would otherwise take you a week. As you take on more responsibilities and you determine that you're going to become more efficient, the responsibility pushes the efficiency. What do they say to There's time enough to sleep when you're in the grave. Analysis of the purpose of memory. People think that the purpose of memory is to remember the past. And that's not the purpose of memory. The purpose of memory is to extract out from the past lessons to structure the future. Lessons to structure the future. So you're done with a memory when you've extracted out the information that you can use to guide yourself properly in the future. Done, done with a memory when you've extracted out the information that you can use to guide yourself properly in the future. Done, done, done with a memory when you've extracted out the information that you can use to guide yourself properly in the future. Done, done, done with a memory when you've extracted out the information that you can use to guide yourself properly in the future. So if you have a traumatic memory, for example, really obsessing you. If you analyze that memory to the point where you figured out how you put yourself at risk and you can determine how you might avoid that in the future, then the emotion associated with that goes away. Memory has a very pragmatic function. And cultural memory is the same thing. We need to extract out stories from our past that structure our future. And we need that because, well, first of all, if you don't have a purpose, it's, uh, it isn't that your life becomes neutral in a, in a meaningless sense. It's that your life becomes characterized by unbearable suffering. Because the baseline condition of life is something like unbearable suffering. Is something like unbearable suffering. And what you have to set against that is a noble and worthwhile purpose. A noble and worthwhile purpose. Hopefully, your determination of that purpose is buttressed to some degree by the wisdom of the past, because you can't conjure something like that up on your own. And if you provide people with nobility of purpose, then they can tolerate the suffering of existence without becoming entirely corrupted by it. And cultures that don't do that, it isn't even so much that they die, it's that cultures that don't do that are dead. They're done. They don't have a story in them, and they don't have a call to adventure. And then, well, then everyone suffers stupidly as a consequence. It's a very bad thing. Bring the story forward and, and propagate it and make it the most noble possible story.
and then you motivate people to transcend themselves, which they need to do. People think of freedom as the ability to implement your whim. And freedom opens up that as a possibility. But sustainable freedom, that isn't what it's about at all. It's primarily about responsibility. It's about determining which load you're going to pick up and carry. That's the proper definition of appropriate freedom. It's not dim gratification of instantaneous impulse. It's self-evident that that doesn't work. Two-year-olds do that. And that's why they can't live in the world. They can't organize themselves across time. They can't sacrifice the moment for the future. And the more sophisticated you get, I suppose, in some sense, the more you're able to do that. And then your freedom becomes the freedom to choose the proper responsibility. That's also not something that we've been good at communicating to young people. If we talk to them about responsibility, we generally do it in a finger-wagging sort of way. It's like, well, you're breaking the rules, you're a bad person. And, and, and well, that may be true. The proper message for young people is to say, well, no, you, you don't understand. You, you want to take on responsibility. You want to take on the heaviest load that you can conceive of, that you might be able to move, because it gives your life nobility and purpose. And that offsets the tragedy, offsets the tragedy, offsets the tragedy, offsets, offsets, offsets the tragedy. And, and not only psychologically, because you have a purpose and something to wake up for, to face the difficulties of the day, but also because if you face the difficulties of the day properly, you actually ameliorate suffering, not only in the psychological sense, but because you make the world at least a less terrible place. And that's something. And that's something. Right, to move things away from hell is something. To move things away from the worst they can be is, well, that's a noble goal in and of itself. There's a lot of really good things going on in the world. We have poverty. Absolute poverty between the year 2000 and 2012. Hundreds of thousands of people are being connected to the power grid every day. Fresh water is available, not to fewer and fewer people, but to more and more people. That's happening extremely rapidly. Starvation in India and China is a thing completely of the past. You never hear about that. And that's pretty much the case for the rest of the world, except now and then for political reasons. You know, everybody's got a cell phone, and anybody who doesn't is going to have one in the next 10 years. And that puts in people's hands a degree of communication and access that would have been absolutely incomprehensible even 15 years ago. All these good things are happening. And just concentrating on this polarization process that seems to have gripped us in the West seems counterproductive given all those good things that are going on in the background. Now that doesn't make what's going on in the West trivial, but it does set it inside a much more positive context, so that's something to keep in mind. Freedom of speech, the right to freedom of speech is central because it's the right by which you defend all the other rights. Well, that's why the idea of logos in the West is the most sacred concept. Christ, think about this psychologically, Christ is the ideal of perfection. This is independent of any religious discussion, any historical act. It doesn't matter. What Christ represents is the perfect individual. Whatever that is. Now, you discuss endlessly what that is. But one of the things the West has settled on is that the perfect individual utters the truthful speech that makes potential into habitable order. Does that through truth? That's embedded in the first few sentences of Genesis, for example. God brings the world into being. And the idea that that truthful speech that brings the world into being from formless potential also characterizes each person. That's our fabrication in the image of God. 
That's the idea of the West. It's an unbelievably remarkable idea that perfection, individual perfection, is to be found in a relationship with spoken truth. God, that's, that's the great idea. Well, it's out of that arises the observation that there's nothing more central to the hierarchy of, of rights and obligations as well, let's say, than freedom of speech. Yes, it's absolutely central. That's why Christ is the word made flesh. The idea is that the perfect individual is the person who's, well, who speaks truth, but also acts out the truth of those words. It's a very, very, it's a, it's a proposition whose merit is virtually self-evident when you understand it in that manner. So yeah, to see assaults on freedom of speech, especially compelled speech, well, that's where I drew the line in my life. It's like, that is the West, it's logocentric. If you want to take the West down, you remove the idea of the divine word from the substructure of the society. So you have to do that. It's like, and this is the level at which this war is being fought. It's fundamentally a theological war. Question. I married young and have had only one sexual partner. Now I desire a variety, but value my marriage and will not cheat. Any insight on in overcoming this conflict? As a matter of fact, yes, I would say get the variety with your partner. You know, there's lots of games you can play to spice up your sexual life. Buy some lingerie, like buy a hundred pieces. You know, buy whatever you need that you might want to experiment with. You have to introduce that spirit of pretend play that you had when you were a little kid into your sexual life and then you have many partners in the same person. Put some thought into it. And sex is a domain in which expertise can be developed just like any other domain. Some of that's play and fantasy play. Some of it's sexual technique. And I guess then the other thing I would say is take stock of each other and see if there are things that you could do in your life that would make you more attractive to one another. You know, those are hard questions because no one wants to say, well, you know, I'd be more attracted to my wife sexually if she just acted X way. And the same with regards to a wife's contemplation of her husband, but those are the real questions, man. If your partner isn't acting in a manner that is sexually attractive, then either there's something wrong with you or there's something wrong with them. Those harsh judgments that your sexual attraction makes are also very useful ways of orienting yourself towards proper behavior in the world. Admit to the variety that you want and see to what degree you can fulfill that within the confines of the marriage. It's also part of coming into contact with the shadow, I would say, if you want to look at it from a Jungian perspective. You might have all sorts of sexual desires that part of you feels should remain taboo. And maybe they should. I'm not suggesting absolute sexually libertine behavior. Maybe they should. I know sexuality has to be regulated very carefully. You might be able to push yourself with some time and effort and contemplation and some admission of fantasy and all of that into domains of sexual satisfaction that you haven't achieved before. I try to do this all the time. I want the best for what wants the best in you. It's like that part, I'm that part's friend. 
it's like I don't have unconditional positive regard. I am not on the side of you that's aiming at your defeat. I'm not at all on that side. I'm on the side of you that's struggling towards the light, right? And I'm on the side of that part of me. At least I'm trying to be on the side of that. And that's the definition of love. And that's the definition of love. I believe. Because what it means is, but I said it. I truly want the best for what wants the best in you. Yeah. And people love that. They love that, man. I'm trying to figure out what's the best for us. Really. The best. Not the best for me, although that's part of it. Because here I am, you know, and I'm in the game too. I'm so greedy, let's say. I don't just want the best for me. That's not enough for me. I'm too greedy for that. Maybe I'm too selfish for that. I want the best for me in a way that's the best for everyone else too. Because that's even better. That's another interesting thing about being bounded by death. You have nothing to lose. You might as well aim for the highest goal because what have you got to lose that you aren't already going to lose? Nothing. Nothing. And you have everything, hypothetically, to gain. If you want to go to university and become a physician, there's a lot of sacrifice of impulsive gratification that goes along with that. But if you become a physician, then it's a noble enterprise, people support you socially, and all of the needs that you need to have fulfilled will also be fulfilled by that enterprise. Well, that's a way better model. Well, that's a way better model. It's strange that the maximum freedom comes with the adoption of a discipline and then also the adoption of responsibility. That frees you up and everyone else around you in the long run. And if you explain that to people, especially in this day and age when they'd be fed a never-ending diet of idiot rights and freedoms. They're immediately on board with it because they know, they know that most of the meaning that people experience in their life is a consequence of adopting responsibility. Adopting responsibility. So they're starving for that. They're starving for that. They're starving for that. The idea to be articulate. It's as if something like the following happened as humanity developed. First, for the endless tens or hundreds of thousands of years prior to the emergence of written history and drama. During this time, the twin practices of delay and exchange begin to emerge slowly and painfully. Then they become represented in metaphorical abstraction as rituals and tales of sacrifice told in a manner such as this. It's as if there's a powerful figure in the sky who sees all and is judging you. Giving up something you value seems to make him happy. And you want to make him happy because all hell breaks loose if you don't. So, practice sacrificing and sharing until you become expert at it things will go well for you. No one said any of this, at least not so plainly and directly, but it was implicit in the practice and then in the stories. Said as well. Action came first, as it had to, as the animals we once were could act, but could not think. People watched the successful succeed and the unsuccessful fail for thousands and thousands of years. We thought it over and drew a conclusion. The successful among us delayed gratification. The successful among us bargained with the future. A great idea begins to emerge, taking ever more clearly articulated form, ever more clearly articulated stories. 
what's the difference between the successful and the unsuccessful? The successful sacrifice. Things get better as the successful practice their sacrifice. The questions become increasingly precise and simultaneously broader. What is the greatest possible sacrifice for the greatest possible good? And the answers become increasingly deeper and profound. The God of Western tradition, like so many gods, requires sacrifice. But sometimes he goes even further. He demands not only sacrifice, but the sacrifice of precisely what is loved best. We'll start our analysis with a truism. Stark, self-evident, and understated. Sometimes, things do not go well. That seems to have much to do with the terrible nature of the world plagues and famines and tyrannies and betrayals. But here's the rub. Sometimes when things are not going well, it's not the world that's the cause. The cause is instead that which is currently most valued subjectively and personally. Why? Because the world is revealed to an indeterminate degree through the template of your values. Thus, if the world you are seeing is not the world you want, it's time to examine your values. It's time to rid yourself of your current presuppositions. It's time to let go. to sacrifice what you love best so that you can become who you might become instead of staying who you are. Something valuable given up ensures future prosperity. Something valuable sacrificed pleases the Lord. What is most valuable and best sacrificed? What is at least emblematic of that? A choice cut of meat, the best animal in the flock, a most valued possession. What's above even that? What constitutes the ultimate sacrifice for the gain of the ultimate prize? It's a close race between child and self. The sacrifice of the mother offering her child to the world is exemplified profoundly by Michelangelo's great sculpture, Paeda. Michelangelo crafted Mary, cradling the nearly naked body of her adult son, crucified and ruined. It's her fault. It was through her that he entered the world and its great drama of being. Is it right to bring a baby into this terrible world? Every woman asks herself that question. Some say no, and they have their reasons. Mary answers yes, voluntarily, knowing full well what's to come. As do all mothers, if they allow themselves to see. It's an act of supreme courage when it's undertaken voluntarily. In turn, Mary's son, Christ, offers himself to God and the world, to betrayal, torture, and death, to the very point of despair on the cross, where he cries out those terrible words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is the archetypal story of the man who gives his all for the sake of the better, who offers up his life for the advancement of being, who allows God's will to become manifest fully within the confines of a single mortal life. That is the model for the honorable man. In Christ's case, however, as he sacrifices himself, God, his father, is simultaneously sacrificing his son. It is for this reason that the Christian sacrificial drama of son and self is archetypal. It's a 
story at the limit where nothing more extreme, nothing greater can be imagined. That's the very definition of archetype. And that's the core of what constitutes religious. Pain and suffering define the world. Of that, there can be no doubt. Sacrifice can hold pain and suffering in abeyance to a greater or lesser degree. And greater sacrifices can do that more effectively than lesser. Of that, there can be no doubt. Everyone holds this knowledge in their soul. Thus, the person who wishes to alleviate suffering, who wishes to rectify the flaws in being, who wants to bring about the best of all possible futures, who wants to create heaven on earth, will make the greatest of sacrifices of self and of child, of everything that is loved, to live a life aimed at the good. He will forego expediency. He will pursue the path of ultimate meaning. And he will, in that manner, bring salvation to the ever desperate world. Archetypal themes are archetypal because they actually speak of the structure of human experience. That's why they last. And human experience has a pattern. You don't have the capacity to articulate that pattern as an individual, in part because your life is too short. You just can't figure it out. But the ancient representations of those patterns are everywhere around you. You know some of them in image. You, you cotton on to them automatically. You fall into them if you go to a movie, for example, because movies always express archetypal themes. If you hear them articulated, you think, I knew that. I knew that. I knew that. I knew that. That's the platonic idea of learning as remembering. Your soul already knows. But it doesn't have the words. But it doesn't have the words. But it doesn't have the words. And so, when people talk to me about watching my lectures, they say one of two things. A quarter of them say, when I listen to you talk, it's as if you're telling me things that I already know. It's like, yeah, well, that's exactly right, because that's what archetypal stories are. They're the description of what you already know. But that can be articulated, and then who you are, and how you see yourself, and the way you describe yourself are all become the same thing. So that's wonderful, then you're not at odds with yourself. You're a functioning unity, and that makes you much stronger and more indomitable than you would otherwise be. And then the other thing that people say, and this is more like three quarters of them, is that they say, I was in a very dark place, I was addicted, I was, I was drinking too much, I had a fragmented relationship with my fiancé, and I wasn't getting married, uh, things weren't going very well with my family, my relationship with my father was damaged, I didn't have any aim, I was wasting my time, some variant of that, some combination of those. And they said, well, I've been watching your lectures, I've decided to establish a purpose, I'm trying to tell the truth, and things are way better. Let's say I've done maybe eight or nine large-scale public talks in the last two months. 20,000 people, and about a third to half of them have stayed afterwards to talk to me, so that's about seven who have said that to me. And then people stop me on the street all the time and tell me exactly that story, which is just... You can't imagine how good it is to be able to go to places you've never been and to have people stop you on the streets. Look, my life is way better than it was. It's like... It's so good. And I've got like, I don't know, 35,000 letters from people. More than that, I can't keep track. It's exactly the same thing. A quarter of them say, well, you've given me the words to say what I already knew was true. And thank you for that. My father, he's 81. I put him in charge of 
of going through my viewer email, which is an overwhelming job, but he's overwhelmed by the fact that so many people are writing and saying the same thing. I have a purpose, man. My life actually matters. I finally realized that, and I'm putting it into practice. And I'm bearing up under the heaviest load I can imagine, and it's really helping. My God, that's tens of thousands of responses now. You couldn't hope for anything better. There's zero harm in it, right? It's just people putting their lives together. They're not mucking about with other people. They're not trying to make broad scale social transformations about which they have no idea. They're trying to make their immediate environment better. And it's working. And it's working. And it's working. A journalist asked me why people are responding so positively to what I'm saying. The young men, for example, and I thought, that's a good question. Well, I'm actually on their side. I'm really happy that they're not wasting their lives. I'm really sad to see that people are disenchanted and nihilistic and depressed and anxious and aimless and perverse and vengeful and, and all of those things. It's terrible. And then to see people question whether that's necessary and then to start to rise out of it. It's like, it's so fun. Like last night, I was at, after my talk, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. think about these things but I was I was after my talk last night and so all these people line up you know they have their 15 seconds with me and they're kind of tentative they're excited and attentive when they come up to talk to me and then they have you know 15 seconds of time to tell me something I'm really listening to them they're hesitant about whether or not to share the good news about their life you know and I think it's often because when people share good news about their life people don't necessarily respond positively you know, they don't get encouragement. And people need so little encouragement. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. And so they'll tell me something good, and I'll think, oh, that's so good. You know, somebody says, oh, I'm getting a long way better with my father. I haven't seen him for 10 years, and now we get along. It's like, God, great. And then the, the power of that, you can't overstate the power of that for individuals to get their life together. The individual's an unbelievably powerful force, and every single person who gets their act together a little bit has the capacity to spread that around. 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 It's a chain reaction. It's a chain reaction. Human beings are weird creatures because we're much more activated by having an aim and moving towards it than we are by attainment. And what that means is you have to have an aim and that means you have to have an interpretation. It also means that the nobler the aim, the better your life. And that's a really interesting thing to know because, you know, you've heard ever since you were tiny that you should act like a good person. You shouldn't lie, for example. And you might think, well, why the hell should I act like a good person and why not lie? I mean, even a three-year-old can ask that question because smart kids learn to lie earlier, by the way. Why not twist the fabric of reality so that it serves your specific short-term need? That's a great question. Why act morally? If you can get away with something and it brings you closer to something you want, why not do it? These are good questions. It's not self-evident. Well, you destabilize yourself and things become chaotic. That's not good. That's not good. And if you don't have a noble aim, that's not good. That's not good. That, that's not good. You have nothing but shallow, trivial pleasures and they don't sustain you. And that's not good. Because life is so difficult, it's so much suffering, it's so complex, it ends and everyone dies and it's painful. It's like without a noble aim, how can you withstand any of that? You can't, you become desperate and once you become desperate, things go from bad to worse very rapidly. And so there's the idea of the noble aim 
It's something that's necessary. It's the bread that people cannot live without, right? That's not physical bread. It's the noble aim. It's the noble aim. And what is that? Well, it's to pay attention. It's to speak properly. It's to confront chaos. It's to make a better world. Make a better world. Make a better world. It's to make a better world. And that's enough of a noble aim so that you can stand up without cringing at the very thought of your own existence. So that you can do something that's worthwhile to justify your wretched position on the planet. We each must avoid falling prey to the temptation of identifying with the chaotic depressing, anxiety-ridden, and nihilism-inducing state of affairs engendered by the terrible confrontation with the genuinely unknown. Even when thrust into the underworld by the dread events of our life, we must not characterize ourselves as permanent inhabitants of that dark and dread place, lest we lose hope, despair, and seek revenge. To progress psychologically, you must let go, sacrifice, Time and again, in the face of successive obstacles, you must abandon those things that, and often those people who, are impeding your progress, despite the fact that you may have held them very close to your heart. When you're wrong, when you've missed the mark, when you've sinned, because that is the meaning of sin, you must let the part of you that is wrong and aiming improperly die. Then, you must allow the new spirit manifesting itself within to spring to life. That new spirit, that's the terrible information contained in whatever error you committed. In living conjunction with the now transformed structures you originally employed to frame the situation. That new spirit, it's a manifestation as well of the potential within you that had not yet been called forth previous travails of your life. Christ is, symbolically, the way and the truth of life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. Embracing the process of voluntary death and rebirth that is identical with psychological development means determining to move forward and upward despite the horrors of life. It means, as well, symbolically speaking, rejuvenating the dead father, or rescuing him from stagnation and deterioration in the eternal underworld. We are all the slaves of Pharisees and lawyers, of those who place dogma above spirit at the cost of spirit. We are all subject to betrayal by ourselves and by all those who surround us. We are all facing extinction in the most torturous of manners. But there is a spirit within us with sufficient courage to confront the true horrors of existence forthrightly. To allow the transformation, even death. Even death. and we all know it. We are all separated from what should be and thrown into the world of death and despair. 
We are all brutally crucified on the cross that is the reality of life itself. To rebel against that fate merely worsens it, transforming what could be mere tragedy into something indistinguishable from hell. To argue bitterly and despair around the deathbed of a loved one is to turn all the pain of death and loss into something far worse. To accept instead? Is that simultaneously to transcend? It's certainly courage and truth and perhaps even love. And these three forces are something to behold. Are they more powerful than despair and the desire for vengeance? That is the Christian suggestion. And the Christian command? To act out the proposition that courage and truth and love are more powerful than death and despair. And to accept what transpires as a consequence.